Well, happy Sabbath, everybody. So nice to be down here visiting all of you in San Diego. It's always a great drive down here, and it's, the weather's lovely. So I always get this little feast feeling whenever I come back here. So a few weeks ago, we had a Bible study on Philippians. There was this part in Philippians that, that Paul was talking about being circumcised on the eighth day and such. Uh, I had brought up that at that point that I was brought up in a doctor's office when I was a child. My dad was an obstetrician and gynecologist, and for the first five years until I went to kindergarten, his office was my playground. We had, uh, obviously, he, over his career, he, was, he, was, he became a doctor when he was 26, and over his career, he probably delivered like 5,000 babies, and you figure half of them are male, you know, on average. And I was this little man guy, and it's like, oh, the little doctor, and I used to have a room there in the office, and I had some of his old equipment and stuff I used to play doctor, but I learned about circumcision pretty early, you know, the, the physical thing that you do to, to children. And so I wanted to elaborate further on that topic of circumcision because it's, it's in the Bible and there, it, it has some really, really deep meanings. So we're, we're going to dig deep and we're going to get this meaning right about circumcision. Because in the early New Testament church, certain false teachers attempted to persuade the Gentile converts that they could not be justified, that is saying have their sins forgiven, by simply repenting, believing the gospel, being baptized, and accepting Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. Instead, they were teaching that justification was only possible if they were physically circumcised and adhered to the temporary laws that were given at Mount Sinai. The apostles rejected this argument categorically. Paul forcefully argued against it in his letter to the Galatians. The Gentile Christians in the province of Galatia were being enticed to accept circumcision so that fellow barriers between them and the Jews would be dropped. All the men, oh, you're all the same. Oh, we're all the same. I mean, that was the the idea they were getting after. Jews typically, in that time, limited their interactions with Gentiles. They had some business activities with them, but any personal relationships you could not do. Eating together at the same table was even banned. Even Peter at first hesitated to go against this taboo of of mixing with Gentiles. So we start our scriptures today looking in Acts 10, and I'll just read it to you because this is just getting us framed for what's going on here. Uh, Acts 10, verse 24, and the, and the following day they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius, now Cornelius was a Gentile, he was Roman, I believe he was a centurion, was waiting for him and had called together his relatives and close friends. Peter was coming in. Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Of course, Peter said, stand up, I'm also a man, don't do that. And then As he talked to them, he went in and and found many who had come together. Then he said to them, you know, it's unlawful for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me something different. He has shown me I should not call any man common. Well, you know, if you recall, Peter has a dream where the sheet comes down. They're all kind of unclean animals. And God said, eat. And again, it was not about making unclean food clean. It was about making him know that you call no man unclean. So, whoever was enticing the Galatians and argued that circumcision was essential to be fully accepted among God's people, that is, the Jews, circumcision would have opened more fellowship to the entire Jewish community. It would also remove much of the tension between Christians and the non-believing Jews. But trying to resolve that issue with circumcision threatened to create a much greater identity crisis. Physical circumcision, think of this, only identified the natural descendants of Abraham. That's what it, one of the reasons it was initially put together. 
Uh, we can look at Genesis 17, if you like, and we can see where this whole idea of circumcision started. That's Genesis 17, uh, verses 6 through 12. And God said, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. At this time, he's talking to Abram, whose name hadn't been changed yet. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations. An everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I will give you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, an everlasting possession I will be your God. And then God said to Abram, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and the descendants after you through all your generations. Verse 10, here's the, here's the hook. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins. And there shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Now we can start to understand why the idea of circumcision was so important to the Jews. Because it represented part of the covenant that they had with God. And it brought them back to their father Abraham. And it goes on to talk about uh, he who was eight days old among you shall be circumcised, every male child in your generations. He who was born in your house, brought for money, any foreigner, anyone who's not your descendant. You know, the eighth day thing is really interesting. My dad told me a long time ago, we had twin boys. He says, you know, we like to do it on the eighth day. I go, well, that's interesting. That's what the Bible says. Why, dad? Well, because they bleed less for some reason on that day. Go figure. I mean, God put it that way. Verse 14, and the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. This physical circumcision is meant to accomplish a couple things. It served as a visible sign of who was Abraham's descendants. But even more, it signified who were the covenant people. It also served as a mark or witness of the all-powerful God in their lives. But now we're in a different covenant. I guess they call it the new covenant. And there is spiritual symbolism associated now with circumcision. And what's interesting is the spiritual symbolism goes back to those children wandering in the desert who had just come out of slavery in Egypt. We can turn to Deuteronomy 10, which is just a few pages up from Genesis. And Deuteronomy, what a wonderful book. I, I've, I've spoken about it, and it seems that it's, it's, it's like the cheat sheet to our, our faith. It has everything in it, and again, it's going to have this in it. So Deuteronomy 10, uh, 15 through 21, it says, The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, you above all peoples, as it is this day. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. Why? Why? Because the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords and the great God, mighty, awesome, who shows no partiality and takes no bribe. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow. He loves the stranger, gives him food and clothing. So I ask you, how do we circumcise our heart? Verse 19, therefore love the stranger. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him, and him you shall hold fast and take oaths in his name. He is your praise. He is your God. And this thought continues on in Deuteronomy 30, a few pages up. Deuteronomy 30, starting in verse 4. If any one of you are driven to the furthest parts under heaven from 
There the Lord God will gather you, and from there he will bring you. Then the Lord God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. You know, it's interesting when we look at this idea of circumcising our heart, we can almost substitute the word love the Lord your God for that word circumcise. Let's go to the New Testament. Romans 2. We're going we're gonna to bind these ideas together. Romans 2. In 25 through 28. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. That's a confusing sentence. So let's, let's make it easy. For loving the Lord your God is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are breaking the law... Your loving of the Lord has become unloving of the Lord. Is that a little easier? Therefore, now let's go back to the physical. Therefore, if the uncircumcised man, the Gentile, keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision, which is to say, loving the Lord your God? And will not the physically uncircumcised if he fulfills the law, judge you even with your written code and circumcision. And then in verse 28 and 29, this is really important for us in this spiritual church, where it says, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, which is to say he is not a Jew who is a Jew outwardly. He is not a Jew who is circumcised outwardly. Nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. Verse 29, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and the circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Through his death, Jesus put an end to the rules that regulated who might approach God, based solely on ancestry. Specifically, circumcision is no longer the mark of who is and who is not God's people. Circumcision, you ready for this? It was replaced by baptism, repentance, and the receipt of the Holy Spirit under the new covenant. Not the covenant that was made with Abraham. This is a new covenant. Therefore, humanly devised traditions that intep to enforce separation, separation, and categorizes people into groups acceptable to God and unacceptable to God are not part of the new covenant. Previously, God worked with a nation that was present on the world scene. That nation called Israel was chosen from among the nations to be separate and distinct. Their distinction came from possessing God's written code, his standards of behavior, the uh, living standards that came from that code. People became part of that nation Israel because they were born there and then were marked with circumcision. Even the people of that nation Israel could only approach God through a group of intermediaries. This was the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. These priests maintained scrupulous regulations to uh, promote the personal and social purity so they could bring atonements and sacrifices to the God that they worshiped and that they had a covenant with. Some of these regulations clearly came from this Bible. They came from God. But Some regulations later were added by the Jewish authorities. Now listen to this. With life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the old way of managing God's interactions with humanity through one nation, Israel, was formally ended. The new way would be through the church of God, which we are here today. 
It is a spiritual nation drawn from all humanity. There's no distinctions. There's no rule. It doesn't say you have to be this or that. God just has to call us. Uh, 1 Peter 2, two, two verses I'll read to you, 9 and 10. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people, but now a people of God, not, who have not obtained mercy, but have now obtained mercy. So now this idea of a nation before God is still present. We in this church of God are that nation. And it's been changed because of Jesus Christ. Under the former ways of doing things, God commanded that males of all the families of the chosen nations carry a mark of circumcision as a sign to separate them from the other nations. God wanted Israel to stay separate from other nations, to avoid mixing true worship with false and continuing with godly principles. It's also interesting, if you think about it, that initially the circumcision was only for males, but now it's for all, and it's in the heart, so everybody can have that circumcision. Separation and distinction remain God's goal, but now it's been being handled very differently. Now the assembly of people who remain separate, who worship in spirit and truth and use his commands to guide their lives is the church of God. With the life and death resurrection of Jesus Christ, the old way of marking people was replaced. The new way, through baptism into the death of Jesus Christ and the receiving of God's Holy Spirit, which baptism makes possible, that's the new way. Colossians 2, 11 and 13. I'll read them to you again. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised in him through faith and the working of God who raised him from the dead. You see, baptism is a physical sign it's a seal. It's a public rite in front of witnesses, testifying of a spiritual reality that has begun in you, the person. And baptism pictures better promises of a new covenant, the re resurrection to eternal life. When Jesus ate the Passover with his disciples, all of them had been baptized. In the flesh, there were people there, obviously, that were of the circumcision, the, the covenant people God had redeemed from Egypt. But now they are about to enter a new covenant through the very blood of Jesus Christ. Another two, two verses, Ephesians 2, 11, oh, three verses, 11, 12, and 13. Paul mentions circumcision as a regulation that marked and categorized people based on ancestry, but then describe the dividing wall that divided people. Verse 11, Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called cir circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants, covenants of promise, having no hope, and being without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off have been brought near to the blood of Christ. You see, Paul teaches that there has been a change. And it's a change that makes all people able to approach God. Paul goes on to the next few verses to mention the dividing wall of a separation and hostile hostility that has been destroyed. Verse 14, for he, Jesus himself, is our peace. 
he has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished his flesh, the enmity, that is, the law of the commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, therefore putting death to death. This is more, a dyna- more than a dynamic picture. It actually is being talked about a wall that was actually built by humans to separate people and to interact their regulations with God. The Jewish leaders, they sat in the seat of Moses. And they had legitimate authority to make rules, to impose regulations as they seemed fit to the situation. But that doesn't mean God liked them. It doesn't mean he liked those rules they made, the improv- improvisations. And Jesus, we know, was highly critical of many of the things that they did. One such regulation was to build a wall inside the temple courts to keep the uh, Gentile visitors from interacting with the Jews. And the Jews thought they needed a physical barrier because around them they were occupied by Roman forces. And there was all kinds of people coming in and out of the country. But the wall was a humanly devised regulation. Circumcision, on the other hand, was God-ordained. The old command has now been updated in Christ. Humanly devised regulations creating separation, such as an abiding wall, are invalid. Under the administration of the new covenant, humanity's access and approach to God is through Jesus Christ. The risen Jesus Christ is the living head of, of God's people. Through Jesus, the members of that body, the church of God, are drawn from all peoples based on faith, not ancestry, race, color. And Jesus is the high priest who offers sacrifices to atone for our violations of God's commands. Through him, Jesus, we can approach God. This is understanding fundamental to the new covenant. Well, let's do a real brief comparison of the two covenants. I'll try and be brief. A lot of people like to think of the old and new covenants as good and bad, harsh God versus loving God. But the terms of the old covenant are much more deeper than that. We can look at, uh, this is easy, we can turn here, Exodus, we're going to go to three different scriptures, and they're just pages apart, and this is the Old Covenant. This is the Old Covenant. We need to know this. So, uh, Exodus 6. Three verses. I appear to... Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, as God Almighty, by my name. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan. So there's one part of the covenant, the land of Canaan, in which they were strangers. We heard this before. This is what he promised Abram. I have also heard the groanings of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. So even those children of Israel were still under this old covenant. Let's move forward to Exodus 19. Now this is right before Moses goes up to uh, Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, and brings down the Ten Commandments. Uh, 19. I like to start. Man, there's so much meat here. We'll start in verse 3. And Moses went up to God, and the, and the Lord called him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you out to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. All the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, there are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded them. 
And verse 8, then all the people answered together and said, All the Lord has spoken, we will do. They took that new covenant and they said, Yes, we will do it. Exodus 24, a couple pages forward. The covenant gets sealed with blood. Verse 2, and Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near me, nor shall the people go with them. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord, the judgments. And everybody said, all the words which the Lord said, we will do. And then Moses wrote all the words early, and then he rose in the morning. And he built up the pillars of stones. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of all the people. And they said, all the Lord has said, we will do. And be obedient. They were accepting that covenant. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. So it was a sealed deal. But now what about the new covenant? The new covenant. We can look at Hebrews 7, which explains this. Now we, now we heard what, what God said to Moses. Now let's hear the explanation of how this all fits together with Jesus Christ. And we're getting ready to wind up on this, this topic. So Hebrews 7. This is good stuff. John, Peter, 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 James, Hebrews. There we go. Hebrews 7. And we're actually going to look at Hebrews 7 and 8. Because this tells the whole story. So in Hebrews 7, it starts talking about Melchizedek. And it's talking about how there is now a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So I'm going to start in verse 22. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. A surety of a better covenant. Uh, a surety is like a guarantee. A guarantee. So Jesus is his guarantee of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were uh, prevented by death from continuing. Well, of course, the Levitical priesthood, they were just all physical. They, they died. They were just man. But Jesus, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Well, there's a great benefit. Our priest never dies. He's forever. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who have come to God through him since he always lived, to make intercession for them. Well, that's what those Levitical priests used to do. They used to do the intercession. Now we got Jesus Christ doing that intersection. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. He who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for themselves, then for you. Jesus did it, he only did it once, and it was done. For he did this once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priest men who have weakness, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who has been perfected forever." Wow. Obviously, Jesus has now replaced that whole Levitical priesthood system in our new covenant. I'm going to go through this real quick. So uh, chapter 8 is really important. Um, verse 3, For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, the Levitical priesthood, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things. Well, we've heard that before, that this whole nation of Israel was just a, a, a sample of a shadow of the things that are really going to come. But now Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry, insomuch he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. The promises of that old covenant, you get, you get Canaan. 
okay? And, and that's great. But the better promises is eternity, eternal life. What a promise that is. So now let's, let's wind this up and get this idea of circumcision back in line. The early church in Acts 15, they, they went on to say that circumcision was not necessary for this new covenant because, again, we have, we have a new high priest. In Corinthians... I'm trying to speed this up, get to the end. In 1 Corinthians 17, verse 20, three verses. But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk, and so I ordain in all the churches. Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. So don't undo it. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. No, you don't have to go through that physical act. Verse 19, circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. You know, they removed the requirements of circumcision, but they did not require, remove the requirements to keep the commandments of God. The circumcision that now matters is the circumcision of the heart. And that spiritual change is now required in his covenant people. In summary, the New Testament church, certain false teachers attempted to uh, make people believe that they had to be physically circumcised to receive the justification of sin and to be forgiven. We know that is not true. Instead, the apostles rejected it, and the, it was a physical act, which only served two things. It, it, it showed that you were part of God's ancestry, his people of Israel, and you had some type of connection to his laws. The spiritual change that circumcision was meant to picture is still required to be part of the covenant people. The circumcision that matters now is the circumcision of the heart, loving the Lord our God, which begins when one repents, one is baptized, and one is begotten by the Holy Spirit. When you put to death the old person and the fruits of the flesh, you become a new spiritual creation through this new covenant and this circumcision of the heart.